Well, I want to welcome everybody this evening. We are back to our members meeting and speaker series. I'm Nancy Howell with Western Cuyahoga Audubon. I think there'll probably be a few other folks that do join in. And um, but I want to welcome everybody and hope everybody's summer went well. Um, I'm not sure about our speakers weather, but we've been having an awful lot of rain here. I think it's stopped now and hopefully tomorrow will be pretty doggone nice. But I want to welcome everybody Tuesday, September 6th. As I mentioned, I'm the board, one of the board members of Western Cuyahoga Audubon. And we are into our 2022-2023 membership year. If you have not renewed your membership or found somebody who would like to become a member of Western Cuyahoga Audubon, please do check out our website and you can renew there, either PayPal, uh, Square, or use your, your credit card, um, and or you can download a uh, membership form, send in a check, whatever is easiest for you. We, of course, have our monthly speaker series and our bird walks, and you'll be hearing a little bit more about some of the things that are happening here with Western Cuyahoga Audubon from some of our other board members. If you would like to get our e-newsletter, which it comes out weekly through MailChimp, basically it's a reminder about events, programs, updates on happening. Sometimes things happen week by week, and we want to get things out to our membership so you can sign up uh, again at our website the wcaudubon.org newsletter sign up that's what you do fill it in so and then if you think you're getting just too many emails again once a week is not too bad but if you think that that's too many you can un unsubscribe at any time so we hope that you can sign up All righty, Michelle. Hi, everyone. My name is Michelle Brocious. I am a board member with Western Cuyahoga Audubon and field trip co-coordinator. Next slide, please. All right, and this evening I'm going to cover our bird walks and how you can connect with us on social media. Next slide, please. All right, so please join us the second Saturday of every month for our second Saturday bird walks. The next one is on September 10th at 9 a.m. at the Rocky River Nature Center. We meet between the upper and lower parking lots and then take a few hours to walk the Nature Center trails. Bill Dininger, Dave Grass Kemper, and Ken Gober are our leaders for the walk. Last year in September, we saw three red-shouldered hawks, six rose-breasted grosbeaks, and seven warbler species with a high count of four magnolia warblers. Uh, join us this Saturday to see what nature has for us this year. Next slide, please. All right, this past second Saturday was held on August 13th, and here is Bill Dininger's report. He says, the second Saturday of the month bird walk started at 64 degrees and ended at 75 degrees and was partly sunny. 26 observers counted 44 species. We had 12 ruby-throated hummingbirds throughout the walk. We observed some hummingbird behavior where the hummingbirds were flying, similar to how a pendulum swings back and forth. On one occasion, I counted 10 of these movements. We had about 30 robins in several locations, many being immature birds. The highlight were two yellow bill cuckoos. Next slide, please. All right, our early evening bird walks take place the third Wednesday of every month through October. Uh, please note the time change. As we get later into the year, we start meeting at 6 p.m. instead of 7 p.m. So this month, the group is meeting at Cleveland Lakefront Nature Preserve. And in October, we're meeting at the Lagoon Picnic Area in Rocky River Reservation. Nancy is leading these walks. Next slide, please. Uh, please join us the fourth Saturday of every month for the Tremont Towpath Trail Urban Bird Walks. We are running these walks through October, through October this year. Uh, we meet at the Cleveland Metro Parks parking lot on Abbey Avenue, just west of Sokolowski's University Inn. From there, your bird walk leaders, Nancy Howell and Al Rand, will guide you north through the Scranton Flats area of the towpath. The next walk is Saturday, September 24th at 9 a.m., so be sure to mark your calendar. Next slide, please. 
All right, finally, uh, please stay connected with us in between our virtual and in-person activities by following us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Be sure to use hashtag WC Audubon when you post a bird photo on Instagram for a chance to be featured on our Instagram page. If selected, I will reach out to you with details. Also, many of our virtual programs are recorded like the speaker series meeting and can be found on our WC Audubon YouTube channel. So be sure to subscribe. I think that's it for me. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much, Michelle. Appreciate it a lot. And I know I haven't gotten that uh, Tremont Towpath bird walk right up to you yet. I've just gotten a little busy, but I get no it problem. Too. Yeah, no problem. Uh, Drina Nemes will won't be able to be here at least at the time, but we, she'd like for me to talk about the book discussion series that she has running. The themes for 2022-23 are climate change, migration, adaptation, and a misunderstood species. And uh, these are run uh, three different times. Come on. Of course, now my screen won't change. Ah, too fast. There we go. All right. So we had been meeting on the fourth Tuesday uh, evening at seven, but we've had to move things to the third Tuesday of uh, for our book discussion meetings. And you can see, please mark your calendars. Uh, again, they're seven to 8 p.m., October 18th, January 17th, and April 18th. So those are the dates for our book discussion or book club series. And what are the books? Well, the one on climate change called Hurricane Lizards and Plastic Squid. Uh, I've read that and I've read several other things by Thor Hansen, fabulous writer, um, just great. You'll, you'll like the, this book uh, as well. Uh, Pigeon Watching, I have not read this one yet. And Rosemary Mosco uh, wrote this uh, and illustrated it. And I am so looking forward to this because it is a misunderstood species. And I think she's gonna, uh, this book really does cover some of the fun things about pigeons. And by the way, pigeons are one of the main species we have at our Tremont uh, bird walk. And then uh, Scott Widensall, A World on the Wing, talking about migration. Scott is a wonderful writer as well. If you have not read any of these other pieces of literature, uh, please do uh, at least read this one and join us for those book discussion series. Drina also wanted me to mention a couple of other things that, that she enjoys and that you might enjoy as well. Um, the Bird Day Book Club, um, and you can see it's migratorybirdday.org. You can see that the, the uh, link there. And this one is called Woody's Last Laugh. And it's kind of interesting. It says how the extinct ivory-billed woodpecker fools us into making 53 thinking errors. Huh, how about that? Um, and so you can join that. And then you can see it's Thursday, September 22nd at eight o'clock. Um, I have not a clue as to what those 53 thinking errors could be. So should be fun. Try it. Another thing that Drina likes to have folks join in on is um, the urban birder. Um, David Lindo has a, a webinar uh, with a really, he has a Zoom interviews with some uh, naturalists, leading figures in uh, natural history. And there are several sessions each month. Um, so you can check out the 20, it says 2023, October 6th. I wonder if she means 2022. I'd have to double check with her. But uh, the urbanbirderworld.com uh, webinar, check that out. I'm sure you can Google it and find out a little bit more about who's speaking and what some of those interviews are about. I also want to mention we do have a fundraiser. Um, we do have a ticket or um, cards for Mitchell's homemade ice cream. They are $10 denominations. They are gift cards. 
and uh, we can send them to you in the mail. Um, you, purchase, you can purchase them at, a, at the Western Cuyahoga Audubon store. And of course, uh, Mitchell's is known for its homemade ice cream, frozen yogurt, sorbet, and even vegan ice cream. And they're all delicious. So if you're looking for a real quick uh, gift or thinking about maybe Halloween, something like that, think about uh, these Mitchell's gift cards. You can get them to you really, really quickly. Now, our coffee coordinator, Amanda, couldn't be here this evening as well. I guess the first Tuesdays are very busy for lots of folks. But we also sell birds and beans, uh, Smithsonian shade-grown bird-friendly coffee. And of course, when you think about coffee and birds, remember the birds that nest here or up in Canada migrate down to Central and South America where the coffee is grown. The bird friendly coffee is grown um, and, and shade is shade grown, which means they leave the natural forest. The coffee shrubs are grown underneath there. They don't use pesticides or herbicides. The uh, communities that pick the beans do benefit. And uh, so it really does help the birds. Um, we, are do, uh, we are sending in orders uh, every three months, we, use, we used to do every month, but every three months, and our next order is going to be placed in October. So by October 10th, please go to our website and order your coffee uh, at that time before uh, or by October 10th, and we'll get it in for you. But don't forget the holidays are going to be coming up too. So the next order after October, would be January and you don't wanna miss the holidays. So order extra coffee for the holidays. It makes a great gift. And uh, so remember, think about that. I do wanna mention our next speaker in October will be uh, Laura Kearns from the Ohio Division of Natural Resources, Division of Wildlife. And she'll be speaking on tracking trumpeter swans. And trumpeter swans have made a wonderful comeback in Ohio since they were introduced. So I think you'll really enjoy the October program on tracking trumpeter swans. But this evening, our September program is about birdability. And I love the title of this because it says, because birding is for everybody and every body. And we did have a change in the speaker. Virginia Rose, who is the founder and board chair of BirdAbility, will be our speaker this evening. And um, so, Virginia, I love the photos that she sent me because all of them show her smiling. You can really tell she is enjoying her birding and outdoor experience, despite the spinal cord injury that she had uh, when she fell off a horse when she was 14. So she has been in a, a, in a wheelchair for all this time, but, she, but she's active. She leads uh, bird outings in Texas and boy, and even the Rio Grande Valley Birding Festival. Maybe some of our members have been to some of the, that festival. I, could ima I can imagine Virginia as a high school English teacher. Uh, I, bet, I bet your students just loved you. And she really just wants to bring that same joy and empowerment uh, and community in birding and, and enjoying birding and enjoying nature to those with mobility challenges and other challenges as well. So this evening we want to welcome Virginia Rose with BirdAbility. And Virginia, are you able to share your screen? I am, but before I do, I just want to say thank you everybody for having me. I was on Google last night trying to learn how to pronounce Western Cuyahoga. And I think I've done it. Although I guess there is some controversy over Cuyahoga or Cuyahoga. So, I, I've been listening to you all for the last few minutes and I'm hearing Cuyahoga. Is that right? Cuyahoga, Cuyahoga, 
Um, people around uh, Akron say Kaga. I mean, it's like two syllables instead of four. So whatever. Um, but yeah, Cuyahoga is fine. You've done, you've done well. All right. So um, I'm going to share my screen. All right, so I am Virginia Rose, founder of Birdability. Can everyone hear me? It is, a little, can, it is a little crackly, but um, I can, can hear well. All right, and can everyone see my screen? Okay, excellent. All right. In 1973, I was 14 years old, living in Evergreen, Colorado, a beautiful mountain town outside of Denver. The very month this picture was taken, I was injured in a horseback riding accident. I was paralyzed from the waist down, and I've been using a manual wheelchair for the last 49 years. Oop, hold on. 30 years later, at age 44, I found birding and life changed. I should have come to it sooner. My grandmother birded well into her 90s. My mom is birding and she's 86. She and I were able to see the berry line hummingbird in the, the Madera Canyon in Tucson two weekends ago. And my sister started birding a few years before I did. Birding gave me a new purpose, a reason to be outside again, exploring nature, and as it turns out, discovering my best self. I remember calling my mom and asking her, Mom, why didn't you tell me I was a nerd? My life would have been so much easier. Maybe some of you can relate to that. What's funny though, is that doing anything new in a wheelchair, or maybe for anybody, is not especially easy. Let's look at some of the difficulties. Parking. My van has a ramp that requires an eight foot access aisle on the passenger side. If I cannot find a place to park, I cannot get out of my van. Gates. There are all kinds of ways in which gates keep people in wheelchairs out of the park. Bathrooms. Enough said. <laughs> the ones that are available are seldom accessible. Steps. Curbs. Mud. Sand. Ruts. Rocks. Gravel railings, railings perfectly constructed to keep me from seeing out. And cattle guards, cactus spines, and cow patties. I am in Texas after all, and I've encountered all three of these things, each with rip roaring stories told in the retrospect. All of these things can equal a serious lack of independence. But you see, difficulties are important because right on the other side of the difficulty is the empowerment and the joy. I used to tell my students, don't expect your greatest accomplishment to occur in your comfort zone. You see, at the end of a birding day, when I come home, I don't just come home with a list of birds and fabulous memories of beautiful places and wonderful people. I come home full of pride and accomplishment because it's hard. 
it's hard for me to sign up for a field trip if I don't know if I'm gonna be able to do it. It's hard to know what I'm gonna encounter and how I'm gonna handle it. But again, as I said, I come home empowered after every single trip, managing all of the various challenges that present themselves. And it's why I always say, no one can predict what an individual with an access challenge can do or cannot do. Not even the person who has an access challenge. You always, you always are going to be surprised at what you're able to do. I always say, you won't know until you go. And then I, I immediately say, dust off your inner explorer because she's probably your best self. Now we get to the joy. The lifelong learning. If there were ever the easiest way to check the happiness box, I'm convinced it's having a lifelong learning situation. And birding sure does provide that. Friendships, travel. In the last eight months, I've been in the West Coast, I've been in the East Coast, I've been in Ohio, and I've been in the Rio Grande Valley. I'm heading to Washington State at the end of this month. The travel has been unbelievably wonderful for me. I'm able to lead accessible events for all kinds of people with various disabilities and to help people wherever I go learn what it means to provide an accessible environment. The physical health that comes with birding the confidence that comes, the independence, the community. I started off as a fledgling birder, taking all the classes, going on all the field trips. Then I began leading trips. Now I've been on the board for years. What a wonderful community birding offers. Lifelong purpose. There's never a reason to be bored if you're a birder. The birds, of course, and all of these things equals empowerment. But after 20 years of birding and seeing no other people on the trails with access challenges, I determined they just must not know about it. All my friends cracked up when I said that. They said, oh, so you think that once all the people with access challenges know about birding, they're all gonna throng the trails? I'm like, well, of course they will. Why wouldn't they? So after 28 years of teaching, I retired, slept for a year and started birdability. The, the mission to share the joys of birding with people who have access challenges and ensure that birding locations and birding communities are accessible to everybody. A great visual for our mission shows the ways in which these three goals have to work in tandem. First and most important is to introduce people with access challenges to birding. That means we have to find them, you guys. They aren't just going to appear. We have to intentionally reach out and find the people who have access challenges. Second, I have to make sure that birding locations are physically accessible. But, so I found people who have disabilities and let's say I have found locations that are physically accessible, but if the birding community is not welcoming and inclusive, then it's all for naught. These three things have to work in tandem. Birdability focuses on people with mobility challenges, blindness, chronic illness, intellectual or developmental disabilities, mental illness, and those who are neurodivergent, deaf, or who have other health concerns. But here's where I sound like a commercial. But wait, there's more. We also focus on all life stages. Parents with strollers, grandparents with toddlers, older people done with the bushwhacking, people with new medical diagnoses, folks with new or grumpy joints. These are our future selves. 
Once we realize that we are not talking about an other, once we realize that we are talking about each and every one of us at some point in 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, then all of a sudden access takes on a whole new meaning. Don't you want a bird until your 70s and 80s and 90s like my grandmom and my mom? So what do you do? You can do what I did. Let me just say here's something about making change. Making change isn't magic. You don't have to be a magician. It isn't that difficult. I spent some time sending emails. I spent some time picking up the phone and it's not that much more than that. First thing I did is to invite birders in my birding group who had access challenges to help me identify local accessible sites. Now, obviously, after I began leading walks, I had to know where all the accessible places were in town. But for people such as yourselves, who may not know people who have access challenges, I would start with my bird club first. Ask, how many of you would love it if you had a more accessible trail? I'll bet you'll see some hands. I would start with that. Second, the first thing I had to do once I realized that this was getting serious was I made a list for walking people of what it means to be accessible. What kinds of things must we consider when we're making sure that a place is accessible? That was my very first document. It is still on our website. It is listed under guiding documents, access considerations. It's there for the world to use. Please use it. Find accessible birding sites at which to hold your outings. Complete a birdability site review and submit it to the birdability map. I can't wait to tell you about the birdability map. It's a dream come true. Reach out to all kinds of places where you might find people with disabilities. I'll show you how I did that. And then hold monthly accessible birding outings. I was able to hold 25 birdability outings, monthly outings before COVID struck. And then I got so busy that I didn't have time in Austin to do it anymore. I'm going to have to find a way back to my Austin roots. So what does it mean to be accessible? I'm just going to start with the basics. First, parking. I alluded to it a little bit ago. If I cannot find a van space with a wide enough access aisle, I won't be able to park and I won't be able to enjoy that site. Second, and I really want to stress the importance of this access consideration, information ahead of time makes all the difference in terms of access. Remember, we cannot know what every single disability is. There's no way. We are not trying to do that. What we are trying to do is help people with access challenges identify for themselves whether or not this is a site they can use. So to that end, this is a fabulous um, sign at the Mammoth Caves Park. I want you to notice some of the information that you see on it first is a mention of the length of the trail, various parts of the trail, so that people can make good decisions about their stamina. Second thing to consider is surface. Some sections are concrete. Some sections have a wooden deck. Some sections are unpaved. All of these surfaces help people make their individual decisions about whether or not this is a surface they can use. A power chair may be able to do things that a manual chair can't do. Next, look at tread width. What that means is that we have a 36 inch wide space. And for some chairs, that will be perfectly fine. My chair is only 22 inches wide. And so I'm going to be able to do all kinds of other things. But notice that these widths help people make decisions about whether or not they can manage this trail. The grade matters. Typical 2.2%, 4.2%. People who are very concerned with grade will know the percentages they can or cannot do. 
and then cross slopes. This means if I'm wheeling and the sidewalk is like this, and I'm heading this direction, it means my right arm is gonna get an awful lot of work. My left arm can be swatting flies. All of this information helps people make decisions about whether or not they can enjoy this site. And if it's online ahead of time, all the better. Next, bathroom accessibility. I love this slide mainly because I wanna encourage you to know that there are accessible porta potties. If you only can afford one, please get an accessible one. Everybody wants to use the bigger bathroom anyway. I also wanted to point out these yellow metal poles. Do you all know what these are called? These are called bollards. B-O-L-L-A-R-D-S. My Australian um, colleague explained that that's the, what we call these. And um, they're important because if they are not spaced properly, they are perfect obstructions for power chairs trying to get in to a space. I always thought ballers was a British cuss word, but now I know different. I also wanted to point out the interpretive signs that you see here. So many things about this slide are helpful information for you. First, notice that the angle of the sign is such that a seated person can actually read the top of the sign. Notice also that the sign is stabilized on a concrete pad. It is not set off the concrete pad in dirt and grass and unmanageable surfaces. This is important. Notice also the height of the sign, two to three, three and a half feet off the ground as a way to make sure that everybody can read it. Kids too. On the right corner, you see a tactile feature. And this of course is for people who are unable to see, but they might be able to feel the sycamore bark. And then to the right, you see an audio feature. Again, this is for people who are blind or who have low vision. It's a way for them to access the same information that a sighted person can. Again, all of this is helping people with access challenges opt in instead of being excluded. Steps or other obstacles. You know, I just love all the walking people who say, there's just one little step. They'll hold their figures like this and they'll go, there's just, there's just one little step. What they don't realize is that one little step can prevent me from being able to manage a path. Another really important point here, and I'm not sure people understand this until I make it very clear. For a place to be accessible means that I can do it by myself. It doesn't mean that someone can push me. It doesn't mean that someone can help me up the step. It means I can manage the trail independently. Very important. On the um, left side, you see these roots and ruts and little steps. And clearly this is not going to be an accessible path for me. It doesn't mean that other people with different access challenges can't enjoy it. On the right side, you see these bird blinds. I know that you all have probably started seeing these fabulous windows that are set lower um, so that a seated person is able to use the binoculars at a, a level that he or she can see. Um, but I want you to notice something else here. Do you see the surface here below, below the bird blind? It looks like it's very loose, dirt, mulch, and maybe even steep sort of a steepness here. That means this entire blind, even though it has a lower window, is not accessible to me. Don't forget that maintenance is an access consideration. We have a perfectly fabulous accessible ramp, a perfectly fabulous deck with a railing that I probably can't see through, but if it's full of snow or ice or overgrown with a large rosemary bush, I'm not gonna be able to access it. Maintenance matters. 
Notice this picture on the right, someone's beautiful idea of making an accessible viewing area by removing the wooden vertical railings, putting plexiglass in so that now as a seated person, I can wheel right up sideways to the edge and look down and see all the things that walking people can see just two or three feet below me. And not only seated people, but kids. Again, I want to remind you that all of these accessibility issues only enhances birding for children too. Now let's talk about the birdability map. This is an amazing thing. I have to tell you how this whole thing came about. Selfishly, I wanted to get in my van and drive across the country finding all the accessible birding spots. I knew where all the ones in Austin were. So I mentioned this when I did the uh, workshop for the National Audubon Convention in 2019. And I said, I have a vision. I want to see all the accessible places for every city in the country. And then I want to have the Austin disabled team invite the Seattle disabled birding team to come to Austin. We host, we show them all the accessible places in Austin and then Seattle reciprocates. Isn't it a beautiful idea? Think of the networking, think of the community. At the end of the workshop, two people came up to me who are storybook or GIS designers, story mappers. And they said, we can do this. And I said, what? I said, we can do this. This is a crowdsourced thing. And six months later, they sent me a draft of the birdability map based on the access considerations I had written. They turned all of those access considerations into questions, created a survey, and six months later, it launched. Can you believe that? Do you know how many sites are on this worldwide map? Over 1,000 sites have been pinned just like people, just by people like you who found a site, analyzed the access of it, and pinned it. Do you realize Ecuador has a site? Costa Rica has a site. Spain, the UK, Austria, Germany, Iceland, Brazil, Taiwan, Canada. Y'all, it's time has come. The world was waiting. Who knew? Let me show you a little bit more about how it works. It's an interactive map. So you can pull it up on, your, um, on our website, on your phone. And when you click on a yellow diamond, that diamond represents a site, a site that someone has analyzed, a site that someone has named, the date it was submitted, the estimated distance. Look at the detail with which this person was able to explain this place. One mile return concrete and wood deck trail through cottonwoods and floodplain, migrant trap in spring, unpaved trail continues onto river sticks, additional 0.6 miles each way. All of these questions are answered by people like you. You don't have to know anything about what disability it is. All you have to do is answer yes, no, and how much. That way, any person with any disability can make his or her own decision. Isn't that amazing? Let me show you the birdability site review checklist. We have a printable version of this. You can print it and take it with you to any site. These are all the questions that you can answer. And then you can immediately pin that site and add it particularly to your area. Usually when I get to this point in the presentation, people start looking at, <laughs> at look, looking at their state. We get a little bit, what's the word? 
uh, loyal about making sure that we have some vertibility um, sites listed in our areas. So this, this, this is a dream and it's just amazing. And what I love about it is every single anybody can do it. So now we found the accessible places and we know what accessible means. Now we have to go find the people who have disabilities. Where are they all? This is what I did. I started with spinal cord injury support groups. I knew they were all over. There's one in every town. Then I went to the amputation support group. Then I went to the multiple sclerosis support group. Then I went to stroke survivors. And I called the facilitators before and I said, I wanna make a 10 to 15 minute presentation about vertibility. And they said, sure. So I went, I told everybody about how fabulous birding was. I explained the difficulties and I explained the joys. And I had people signing up from every single place I went, I would pick up two or three interested parties. Then I went to assisted living centers. These are residents who are not able to leave, but they can still bird. So I helped them set up birding stations. I set, helped them, um, I talked to the activities director. And then I went to the Wild Birds Unlimited store in the neighborhood and got them to donate the bird feeders, the bird baths, and the seed. So not only am I bringing residents to birding, but I'm bringing the communities together too. And Travis Audubon is helping make that little um, community work as well. Then kids disabled camps. There are hundreds of kids disabled camps across the country. It's the perfect fit. Not only are these camps already accessible, but who better to get binoculars kids. So I'm working hard on getting kids disabled camps, having birdability um, programming. Veterans services. We cannot forget that veterans are as in need of nature therapy as anybody we, need, we know. Paralyzed veterans, wounded warriors. There's all kinds of ways in which we can serve veterans. Did you know that special education is now called exceptional education services in public schools? I just found out found that out recently when I was preparing for this for this particular presentation. But these people are these um, um, special education, exceptional education teachers are always looking for creative ways in which to engage these students. So we are working with middle school exceptional education services and having them take field trips to accessible birding spots. I contacted the regional Easter Seals and then I went to the Easter Seals gym and I picked up two and three people everywhere I went. Then I went to rehabilitation hospitals and gyms. There's a group in Austin called Rehab Without Walls. It's an ingenious way to get therapy more authentic by helping people who need therapy be in their happy places. So instead of being in a gym, these people may be in a bowling alley with their therapist. These people may be at the grocery store with their therapist. These people may be birding with their therapists. So pretty soon we started doing quarterly walks with people from Rehab Without Walls. I would meet them at accessible parks. Schools for the deaf and blind. We're working with them too. Centers for Independent Living. Remember, these are residents who are still able-bodied enough to get on a bus or a van and meet me at accessible places. Again, I set up quarterly walks for these folks. Scouting and 4-H groups have a unique role to play. Not only can we make sure that scouting is recognizing the disabled amongst them and giving them ways to do birdability, but they also can be helping provide benches, provide kiosks, provide other ways of making a thing accessible. 
And finally, there's an adaptive sports organization in every city, in every state. And these adaptive sports organizations are already set up with disabled people who are living more active lives. So now we know where the disabled people are. Now our third section, our third goal is creating welcoming and inclusive organizations. First, we wanna make sure that we've created an inclusivity and diversity statement. And we are holding our employees, volunteers and organizations accountable. Next, hold accessible bird outings as part of your regular programming. Include accessibility information. Again, this is called opting in instead of forcing people to opt out. Don't forget to include image descriptions for social media posts. This of course is for people who are unable to see and they need to have access to the same image. Include closed captions for all webinars and meetings, even if no one has asked for them. Remove financial barriers to access whenever possible. Don't forget that finances have something to do with access as well. And pr provide honorariums for your consultants, always as a way to be respectful. Three things that savvy trip leaders can start doing today. First, be familiar ahead of time with the physical accessibility of every birding site where you're leading outings. I do that to make sure that there are restrooms that are accessible, that there are benches available, and that there are surfaces that are not gonna end up being difficult for people. Learn basic disability etiquette. I'll give you three quick ones right off the top of my head. First, remember that your seated participants are two feet below your faces and your conversations and your eye contact. The easiest way to include a seated person is to look him or her in the eyes frequently and with intention. Everybody else in the field trip will take note and follow suit. Let me give you two other pieces of disability etiquette. When you have seated people on a birding trip, please, if, if there's an opportunity for you to speak to them ahead of time, I always try to just ask them if there's any way in which I can be helpful. And if so, how? Really important to ask how. Also remember that if someone says no, that you need to respect the independence and stand by. Include a welcome statement at the beginning of your field trip, including your name, your pronouns, and an invitation to share any access needs. So for instance, at the beginning of my field trip, I'll say, my name is Virginia Rose, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm a paraplegic of 49 years, I use a manual wheelchair. Occasionally I might need help up a hill, but wait for me to ask, do not just zoom me all, rocket me off up into the hill, up the hill without um, me knowing that you're doing that. All right. And second, land acknowledgements. Um, I think this is, this land acknowledgement business is slow to get going, but I think it's important. And I looked up what it sounds like, just so you guys have an idea about what it might be. You might say at the beginning of a field trip, this meeting is being held on the traditional lands of the Hopewell or Whittlesea people. And I pay my respects to elders, both past and present. Appropriate field trip etiquette. I always do a rundown at the beginning of my field trips. First and foremost is if you are photographing Please be mindful of where you and your camera are. Please be mindful not to obstruct anyone's view. Be mindful about walking in front of anyone, seated or not. 
Remember also that we are listening for vocalizations. So too much chit chat might be distracting for others. These are just basic etiquette rules, but they also create a safer environment. And by safe, I mean respectful. Ways to get involved. Contribute site reviews to the birdability map now that you know how. Become a birdability captain. These are people, we have 60 across the country. These are volunteers who play integral roles in spreading birdability across the country. They do all kinds of important things. They help with merchandise. They help with social media. They help with getting big sits and, and other events going across the country. Advocate for accessibility improvements in your community. Share our resources with anyone and everyone who might benefit. Every single document or resource that is on our website, we put there for a reason. We want to spread it far and wide. Sign up for our monthly newsletter to keep up to date. Follow at Birdability on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Share our posts. And please donate to help support our work. We are a brand new 501c3. And we've done amazing work in a short amount of time. But we are still in our infancy, y'all. And then finally, I just wanted to share with you my epiphany in nature. And I know every one of you has had something similar happen. I was in an East Texas forest, the big thicket. It was springtime. It was aromatic. It was 6.30 in the morning. And the rest of my walking party had wandered off the path and left me on the bridge. I was spellbound with bird song the wood thrush, the hooded warbler, the yellow-throated warbler, the high sewing machine song of the pine warbler. And it struck me that I was meeting my very best self and was happier than I'd ever been. I determined right then that the best we can be is waiting for us in nature. Thank you guys. I appreciate your attention and I'm open to any questions whatsoever. Am I there? Are you here? Yeah. Are we together? Yeah, I, I, we are. <laughs> Um, I'm Suzanne Aldridge and I have a mobility disability and I've been birding on and off, but I've met and heard more courage out of you in the last hour than I have myself. Um, there are a lot of birding trails in Ohio that aren't accessible. And it's, it's kind of discouraging, but I keep pushing a rollator through <laughs> and I met I wanted to mention that you you might want to list grass on your list of. Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> oh but, yeah. Um, I think I found your site a while back, and I had one question for you. And the question sure. was: Are a lot of the national parks do they have more accessibility than some of the state parks do? You know, I have to tell you, it varies widely. Um, it is still a not well understood art to make something accessible. My philosophy, Suzanne, is to identify all of the things we can do first. Have that be our reason. Find all the one, all the things we can do. For instance, when I list 30 accessible parks in Austin, one of them is uh, the, it, the only thing accessible about it is the parking lot, but that's where you can get the golden cheek warbler. So mm. 
these are the things I try to do. It's like, okay, what can I do? What parts of a park are accessible? And then my idea is that once we've identified all of the places we can that we can do, then people are going to start to call, and that's already happening with me. I've got I have at least I would say five businesses or parks, private birding sites calling me, like Rockport called last week and said, we are undergoing a restoration. We want it to be accessible. Can you please come and help us make it accessible? So, and now it's getting to where birding sites want to be on the birdability map. So I use it as leverage, right? So now I'll go to a birding site and I'll keep a little list. And then at the end of my, at the end of my um, scout, I'll meet with the powers that be. And I first tell them all the things that are great about their park. And then the second thing I do is I say, these are the things that can be improved upon so that you can be on the birdability map. And I know you want to be on the birdability map. And they're like, oh, yes, we definitely want that. And so then I start working with them. They're like, well, where's the money for that going to come from? Like McAllen Nature Center. I said, I know. Let's brainstorm a list of the top 10 independent businesses in this town. And then we wrote a letter. And we said, don't you want to have something to do with having the only accessible birding place in McAllen? And you just start, you just... Like my mom says, you just become a force of nature. <laughs> well, if anybody has any other questions, please raise your hand. I just want to make a, a comment that this is really inspiring. I mean, I never really thought about veterans groups. Uh, certainly, I've, I've given some thought about some of the, you know, assisted living and things like that. Um, and I know our, our park systems around Cleveland are, are quite good. Um, they've got, you know, all purpose trails and things like that. Um, but, you know, as I'm walking around, I see railings that are just the wrong height. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, having some family members that were in wheelchairs, I find that, yeah, grass and roots and even thresholds of buildings. I mean, yes. it's like, really? Why is it so lumpy? <laughs> I, I, know. I, I, I understand. But um, what I did in order to find all the accessible places in Austin is I just made a list of the city parks, the county parks, the state parks, and the national parks that were within my driving range and I just systematically went to every one hmm. and you know I can't stress enough that you won't know if you can do it until you go and when you then when you do go you make notes about what works and what doesn't work and then it's just this systematic following up and it has to be in a joyful cheerful encouraging way because you want people coming toward you right yes working with you you want sure. people wanting to engage with you and you do that with the way you approach it anybody else have a have a question or certainly a comment that Again, this the, I, I um, there were lots of things that just really inspired me. For this. I I used to I, Suzanne again. I used to date a man who was spinal cord injured, and I really got my eyes opened. He could only go to places that he knew were accessible, and he wasn't a birder. But generally, if this group is planning on looking at the park system as being more accessible, you need to involve the disability community because we look at the world in a different way. Yeah. Oh, I know. I've been in a chair 49 years. <laughs> I'm part of that. I'm part of that community. 
And I, um, as a field trip co-coordinator of um, Western Chicago Audubon, just watching this presentation, I never occurred to me that, yeah, one step, when you said that, Virginia, one step can make that difference. And I started thinking about our second Saturday bird walk, and there's a, a boardwalk that just has one step down. And that has ruined that experience for anyone that that is seated. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a different route we could take if we ever have a seated individual that I can pull the leaders inside and say, hey, we should take this different route around that boardwalk and maybe it will be more accessible to the individual. So uh, I, I totally see that, Suzanne, like, you know, yeah, we need to involve the the um, disabled community because I, I never would have thought of that. Mm -hmm. And that's when you can get the local 4-H or the scouting groups in to help mm -hmm. because maybe they could modify that boardwalk. Maybe they could create a, a ramp, a step, yeah. you know, and how great for them to be helping the community and opening their eyes up to what it means to be accessible. Yeah, for sure. That's a great idea. Um, and I also just had a technical question about the, um, the map. If you visit a site... Um, that's already on the map and you find that it's changed like either for better or for worse. Um, is there a, a way to update that entry in the map? There is. Um, I am not the tech person in the family. I don't know if you could tell, <laughs> but I, I always like to say my disclaimer is all I can really do is bird in a wheelchair and the rest, <laughs> the rest mm -hmm. is something else, but I know that we do have a tech person who can make those kinds of updates, Michelle. So okay. if you um, if you use the info at birdability.org, you'll reach the right person. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Sure. But my I, question is, there's a, an area that is fabulous for birding, but it is <laughs> totally right inaccessible <laughs> right. for for people with even a dodgy knee. Yep. <laughs> um, right. There's a, a, a turnstile that you have to go through. There's okay. roots. It's like everything you is mentioned is, is there. there. Yeah, exactly. Where is it? The oh, lakefront. Cleveland Lakefront Nature Preserve. Oh, and no. I've always thought, and see, it belongs to the Cleve City of Cleveland Port Authority, and I've always thought boy, wouldn't it be wonderful if at some point they would open the, the big service gate? Yes. And there's a, a hill, but if we had like golf carts that we could drive people around, I mean, the, the trails are wide enough, um, you know, but then I've heard that people with certain, with disabilities don't really want to be picked out and said, oh, this is just for people with disabilities day. Not, that's not what we want to do. I think it would be kind of fun to have, you know, it opened up. So working with the Port Authority, I don't know how easy that would be. I think, I think we could do that. Now, well, getting golf carts might be another thing. <laughs> yeah, Nancy, you're doing exactly what I was hoping you would be doing, which is brainstorming, thinking, what can I do? What I, that's all I ever did. It's like, okay, what can I do to make this happen? And then just start taking these little baby steps and then things happen. Like for instance, there's this fabulous park in Tucson, but it, there's a section of it that's completely inaccessible. My sister used to have to drag me through. It's like a gully wash thing. She dragged me through, but then once I was on the other side of that wash, then the birding was fabulous. And so I just did a little sleuthing and found out who owned the park. And I found out that the neighborhood association owned the park. And once I found out that the Neighborhood Association owned the park, I just sent them a list of all the ways in which that park met the requirements of the birdability map, how great it was, how perfect it was for people in wheelchairs, and the fabulous birds that they could get there that they can't get other places. And then at the end of the letter, I just said, we just have this small little problem. It's this, second, <laughs> it's this section between the parking lot and the trail proper. What can we do about that? And so just open up the dialogue and get everybody with their good ideas to solve a problem. And I think that's why birdability has taken off. These are such happy 
situations to be involved in. You know, it's like, okay, let's fix it. People <laughs> want to be involved with something that's feel good. They do. They want to help. And so then you're in the business of helping them help. I have another question. Um, have you ever gone to birding festivals with the birdability group where you've actually advocated for like accessible um, accommodations and transportation so that you could participate at the festivals just my, as well as, yes, as my, people without disabilities? Yes, my very first goal three years ago was to make sure the festivals were on board. This year alone, I participated in five festivals. Last year, I participated in four. Next year, I have six festivals on the agenda. And the way I did it, I just called them up and I said, it's time for you guys to get accessible events on the schedule. I can tell you how to do it and I'll lead. Mm -hmm. So in February, I was at the San Diego Birding Festival. The November before that, I was at the Rio Grande Festival. In May, I was in three festivals. One's the biggest week in birding in Ohio. I led events there and did workshops. Then I competed in the World Series of Birding in Cape May. Oh, wow. That was the first disabled team in the history of the World Series of Birding. Wow. And then the next thing, the very next day, it seemed like we were um, leading accessible events for the Cape May Spring Festival. And um, I'm going to Washington State at the end of the month for the Audubon chapters of Washington State and leading some accessible events there. So festivals are totally getting on board. Now we just have to find the, the disabled people in each of those towns. That's got to be super intentional outreach and it needs to happen months ahead of the event. Do you see what I'm saying? So much work to do. I, I have another question. Do you have a constant companion that goes with you to all these events or, you know, not yet. <laughs> you don't have a personal care attendant that goes with you that in uh, case you run into a snag, they can unsnag you? No, I've never, I, my dad says she's never gotten herself in a crack she couldn't get out of. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that it's not going to happen, especially as I'm aging. Oof. Yeah, a lot of a lot of gray hairs here, as you might see. Not yeah, you, not you, not you, Michelle. <laughs> um, Virginia, do you drive? Oh yeah, I've been oh. driving since I was fifteen. Okay. Yep. So your van must be modified. It is, mm -hmm. and um, I live alone in a house that I can get in and out of, and. The world is kind of my oyster, except when it isn't. <laughs> Just sometimes. You guys have been a great audience. I sure appreciate the questions. And please feel free to, if you have any other questions or comments um, or ideas, please feel free to go to info at Birdability and we'll get back with you. Yep. Thank you. Well, wow, this Thank was you. fabulous. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to meet you, work with you, and hear about the organization. And I hope that all of us at one point can meet with a group, a person, um, maybe start something that we can be proud of. Right. And do you, any of you all go to the Biggest Week in Birding? Do you go to that festival? Okay. Well, maybe I'll see you there next time. Cool. Come yeah. Come find me. I'm at the booth. There's a birdability booth. Oh, in, in at Mommy Bay. Yeah, I like to say I woman the booth. <laughs> There's no manning the booth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Y'all have been great. Thank well, you very much. To seeing you. All right. Thank, thank you so much. Oh, thank you're you. more than welcome. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye.